to my neighbour, the member for Hendon, for securing this debate. I'd like to reflect briefly on the, some of the circumstances that led to this declaration, and in preparing my speech, I've drawn heavily on the work of um, Simon Seabag Montefiore in an excellent article he recently produced in the Sunday Times. Zionism may be a word which was only coined as recently as 1890, but the aspiration to return to an ancient homeland dates back nearly two millennia to AD 70, when the Romans defeated the Jewish revolt, marking the end of the Jewish state until its revival in the modern era, Mr Chairman. Support for the return of the Jewish people to Zion has been present in a strand of evangelical Christianity in England since at least the 17th century. Indeed, it formed part of the background to Oliver Cromwell's decision to readmit Jewish people to England in 1656, some 366 years after their brutal expulsion in 1290. Prominent evangelical Christian figures in the 19th century, such as William Wilberforce, also backed the idea, and support for a homeland for the Jewish people gathered pace after a series of horrific pogroms in Russia over the course of the 19th century. As we've heard, Arthur Balfour, the Conservative Foreign Secretary at the time, was also sympathetic to the cause, as was, as was Lloyd George, the son of a Baptist minister and well-versed in Bible studies and the evangelical interest in Zionism to which I've referred. So the debate raged in London, in the cabinet room and in the drawing rooms, and meanwhile, General Allenby and his forces moved ever closer to Jerusalem, about to become the first Europeans to control the city since the expulsion of the Crusaders by Saladin in 1187. There was significant opposition to the declaration from figures such as Lord Curzon, but Balfour and Lloyd George ultimately prevailed, and a compromise was reached um, to ensure it was clear the text um, acknowledged the rights of both the Arab population of Palestine and the Jewish people. Although the declaration is dated 2nd November, it was not published until the 9th, the night before Lenin seized power in Russia. Historians have speculated to this day on what might have happened if this profoundly world-changing event had occurred earlier, but close as it was to the publication, it didn't halt the declaration. And as we've already heard from many participants in this debate today, the declaration, of course, set in train the events which eventually led some 30 years later to the recreation of the State of Israel. Unlike others, I believe this is a cause for celebration and that we in this country and in this parliament should take pride in the role the Balfour Declaration played in leading international opinion and promoting Jewish self-determination. And I think our role in helping to create the State of Israel and its many achievements over its 69-year history is, as others have said, something to commemorate with a sense of pride. On the eve of this important centenary, it is heartening to know that the UK-Israel bilateral relationship is stronger than ever. And of course, this debate is also a timely reminder that just as the UK helped to create the modern State of Israel, so in this country, we should help finish the work that began with the Balfour Declaration and its aspiration to safeguard the interests of both sides. That means redoubling our efforts, Mr Chairman, in supporting the search for a peaceful negotiated settlement to give Israel the security that it needs and delivers a viable and sovereign Palestinian state. And I urge the Minister to recommit to those important goals this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah.